Hello and thanks for listening. When I was an officer in the Air Force, I became an ICBM commander. I had the keys to launch a nuclear armed rocket. Now it takes a lot more than just a key to get those things off the ground. In those days we could only launch if a nuclear weapon had been detonated on American soil. But I would have been the last step in the process. Turning that key would have unleashed Minuteman II rockets that would have traveled to the other side of the earth in about 28 minutes. Training to control and understand these rockets got me interested in aerospace science, and I started working on a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. Flying was not a necessary part of my job. As I spent my workday deep underground, communing with computers and warning light at a launch control center. As I studied though, I found that I wanted the experience of flying an airplane. I found a civilian instructor and got my pilot's license. I would spend long hours flying small planes around the vast open skies of Montana. During these flights I would often dream of having a ship that could fly on out into space. Not long after I took up flying and before I could finish my degree, I was accepted into medical school and put my dreams of space flight on hold. It was two decades later that I decided to go back and finish a master's degree in space science. It was only then that I fully began to understand the physics behind why my little plane would never have been able to fly me into space. But something like this can. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and support us on Patreon if you can. We appreciate your help and feedback. It is our goal at the Terran Space Academy to prepare for a bright future in the space industry. To accomplish this, we work together to get through the calculations so that we can understand the concepts of rocket dynamics. During any space mission, no matter how accurate our initial navigation information and propulsion systems, we will have to check constantly to make sure we are on course. Inevitably, at some point in the journey, we will find that we have deviated enough from our intended goal that a correction burn is necessary. Constantly monitoring our progress and making minor corrections as we go gets us safely to our destination. For these lessons, our destination is a good understanding of space science. And in some lectures, an observant scholar finds that we didn't get something quite right. We appreciate these corrections. It is how we all improve. In this case, Keyboard Runner pointed out a needed clarification. In one of our lectures, we indicated that max Q, or maximum aerodynamic stress, coincides with transitioning from subsonic to supersonic flight. This is not correct for rockets. These concepts should be separated, as one does not depend on the other. Both are dangerous transition points. But for rockets, they are dealt with differently. You punch through the transonic barrier as fast as possible but you throttle back at max Q. Let's do an error analysis and see where we went wrong. Both max Q and the sound barrier are caused by air resistance. Air resistance is the force felt by our airplane or rocket, or by a sound wave, as it pushes the air molecules out of the way and forces itself through the atmosphere. This lecture will cover the aerodynamic principles of thrust, weight, drag, and lift as it relates to airplanes and rockets and we will analyze the equations that tell us the maximum aerodynamic pressure so that we will be able to find the maximum aerodynamic force and understand max Q. We will also evaluate Mach speed, which tells us where we will find the sound barrier in a particular fluid, which includes gases like air. Let's go back to the basics. Force equals mass times acceleration. We multiply kilograms by meters per second squared and get kilogram meters per second squared or newtons. Thrust is the force produced by our ship's engines. We multiply the mass propellant flow, called M dot, in kilograms per second, times rocket engine exhaust velocity, VE, in meters per second, to get the thrust or force produced by our rocket engines. Kilograms per second times meters per second gives us kilogram meters per second squared. Newtons again. Weight is what we call the force of gravity acting on a mass. On Earth, gravity has an acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared. If we multiply that by the mass, we get the force of gravity, which again we call weight, also in newtons at kilogram meters per second squared. On the Earth's moon, the force of gravity is only 1.62 meters per second squared. So our weight there is less, but our mass is the same. 
Now let's look at aerodynamic drag. At low speeds, the air easily moves out of the way and our ship travels smoothly with little resistance. This is called laminar flow because the moving air flows in layers without turbulence. At higher speeds, the air can't move out of the way fast enough and we experience a resistance. The air also starts to compress against the leading edges. Compressed air heats up and there will be some heating at the leading edge of our ship. The SR-71 Blackbird was a jet aircraft designed for high-speed surveillance. As a jet, it had to stay at a low enough altitude to feed the engine's oxygen. The top cruise speed of the SR-71 was around Mach 3.5, as it flew at an altitude of 25,500 meters. The air is thin and cold at this altitude, but the limit to how fast this titanium ship could safely go was determined not by the engine power, but by the temperature of the air hitting the leading edges and the compressor blades. The cockpit glass itself had to withstand a temperature of 338 Celsius, almost twice the average baking temperature in an oven. Jet fuel was pumped around the nose and leading edges of the wings as an active coolant system. Air resistance can be considered somewhat synonymous with drag. Aerodynamic drag is the force opposing your flight through the air as a result of air resistance. Everything moving through a fluid, which again includes air for these calculations, encounters drag. Drag can be complicated. There are three main types of aerodynamic drag, lift-induced, parasitic, and wave. Lift-induced drag pushes your ship up, away from the Earth's gravity, so it can be helpful. Parasitic drag is caused by a combination of form and friction drag. It drains power, but does not contribute to lift. Form drag is related to the cross-sectional shape of the ship forced through the air. Friction drag is related to the amount of surface area in contact with the air. Wave drag is created when any part of the ship or propeller moves faster than the speed of sound. Anything that goes transonic creates shock waves, and these dramatically increase drag. Each of these affects the flight characteristics and the power and fuel requirements of our ship. Only lift-induced drag can be helpful for airplanes and rockets in flight. All types of drag help on re-entry. Lift-induced drag is caused by the wings or body of the airplanes or rocket being pushed back by the air as it is being compressed. When we push on air, it pushes back on us. Lift is when the air pushes you in a direction opposite to the force of gravity. If the lift is greater than the weight, then your ship goes up. It takes power to produce enough velocity so lift can overcome the weight. Lift can also be in other directions if you're going into a banking turn, but it's usually considered straight up from the ground. Wings produce lift in several ways. One is that an airfoil or wing is shaped like this to produce lift. The air that is split at the front or leading edge of the wing tries to go across the top of the wing and get to the back or trailing edge at the same time as the air going under the wing. From this shape you can see that the curve at the top of the wing will make a greater distance for the air to travel than at the bottom. As a gas or liquid moves faster, it exerts less pressure perpendicular to its direction of travel. This low pressure air above the wing helps pull it into the sky. Another cause of lift is the buildup of compressed air under the wing lifting up. If you increase the angle of attack, you increase lift, but you also increase drag. If the thrust is greater than the drag, then your ship accelerates and climbs. If the thrust is less than the drag, then your ship slows down, and if it slows too much, it will stall and fall from the sky. Angle of attack must be considered carefully. There is one more type of lift to consider. When you go fast through the air, you create turbulence. This causes vortices to form from the back of your ship, from the tips of the wings, and over the wings themselves. The vortices from the back of the plane can be dangerous to other planes, so they must stay back until the vortex dissipates. Vortices from the wingtips cause drag that slow the plane. And you will see these little fins on the end of modern passenger jets. These help recover some of the wingtip vortex energy and reduce drag saving thousands of tons of jet fuel a year. You might not think vortices affect rockets much, but they do. Vortices form on the sides of rockets producing drag. And our starship has wings. There is another issue. A rocket does not fly on wing lift. It produces more thrust than it weighs and is able to go straight up. Very few airplanes produce this much power. The F-15A was the first fighter jet advertised to have this ability, but modified F-104As with J-79 engines and several MiGs probably could also. A rocket doesn't fly using lift like an airplane. It must constantly fight the force of gravity pulling it back down. When a rocket is going up, we call the weight of our ship pulling back gravity drag. 
All this means is that the force of thrust must overcome the weight of our ship, or we just stay on the launch pad. Let's look at something small like a jetpack. The acceleration due to gravity on Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared. If I have a mass of 100 kilograms with my jetpack, my weight is 981 newtons. If my jetpack produces 1,000 newtons of thrust, I must subtract the 981 newtons of gravity drag. That leaves me with a net force of only 19 newtons, which would accelerate my 100 kilograms at less than 0.2 meters per second squared. Not very good. But as I burn fuel and get lighter, I can go much faster. Now let's look at lift-induced drag. There are two components of lift-induced drag, vortex drag and lift-induced viscous drag. Vortex drag is caused by turbulent air creating negative pressure pockets. These pull back on your ship as you travel through the air slowing you down. But vortices can be useful. The large vortex we see here over the wings can create low pressure areas and improve lift. And Sam Rogers uploaded this design for a vortex cooled rocket engine. One of the limits on rocket engines is that the combustion chambers can get too hot. A vortex induced in this rocket chamber can keep most of the combustion away from the walls allowing his clear plastic rocket engine to survive. Viscous drag must also be considered. Think of viscous drag as the particles of air sticking to your ship or the boundary layer around your ship. It is a type of friction drag like parasitic drag, but if they stick in the right places, they can help produce lift on an airplane wing and be useful. Heavy objects fall slowly in water because of viscous drag. Remember that viscous drag is a type of lift-induced drag. Parasitic drag is the same type of drag not producing lift. Think of lift-induced drag as being caused by the air not being able to get out of the way fast enough from inertia and stickiness. And it takes force to push the air out of the way. Because the air is resisting this force and pushing back, the particles hang there and support your wing for an instant. Lift-induced drag helps keep an airplane in the air by supporting its weight, while vortex drag can create a pocket of negative pressure above the wing to help pull it into the air. These forces affect rockets also. Rockets have to turn horizontally to get enough speed relative to the planet to achieve orbital velocity, and their entire structure works like a wing during passage through the air. As they start to turn, air is compressed under the ship, providing lift, and vortices and other effects can create an area of low pressure above the ship. The lift generated helps fight the force of gravity, pulling it back down. This horizontal turn is called a pitch-over maneuver. This has to be done before the rocket is going too fast or the forces generated can tear the rocket apart. The engines gimbal and the rocket starts to turn, controlled by the inertial guidance system as you see here. After the rocket turns a few degrees to tens of degrees, depending on the design of the rocket, the engine gimbals back to neutral again, pointing straight down the axis of the rocket. Gravity will now try to turn the flight path back toward the ground on its own, slowly turning the rocket more and more horizontally as the rocket continues to speed up. If the rocket lost power, it would fly in an ellipse and hit the ground. It's only an arc if you don't make it. By the time the rocket is in level flight relative to the Earth's surface, it is above almost all of the atmosphere, and traveling fast enough that the path of its fall coincides with the curve of the Earth. It constantly falls but never hits. This is the definition of free fall. With a multi-stage rocket, engineers may design a little coast time after first stage separation before the second stage fires to allow the rocket to naturally complete more of this pitch over. This works well for rockets launched in a thick atmosphere like Earth or Titan reducing aerodynamic drag and stress. The second stage fires when the rocket is closer to horizontal and does not have to burn fuel making this maneuver. None of this applies to launching from the moon or any other extremely low atmosphere place like Deimos or Mercury. You go up high enough that you'll have enough time to go horizontal and achieve orbital velocity before you fall back to the surface. You will need a pitch over maneuver, but there would be no lift or drag to help. Drag can be helpful in other ways too. Upon re-entry, we want as much drag as possible to slow our ship before deploying parachutes or firing the landing engines. Re-entry starts with a deorbit burn where we bring our horizontal velocity down to where gravity will bring us into the atmosphere over our landing location. The capsule enters the atmosphere and will automatically orient itself with the bluntest side toward the flight direction. We want a blunt heat shield and as much surface area as possible to produce turbulence and slow our ship. Remember that vortices above a wing or ship create negative pressure and lift to slow our descent as you can see in the diagram here. Drag is so complicated that you can spend an entire career studying only drag. This would make you an aerodynamicist. We want to stay generalist, so we will focus on a general understanding of this force. We can calculate the drag imparted on a ship using the drag equation. The drag equation gives us a general total drag value. 
This equation requires us to know the density of the atmosphere where we are flying, the velocity of our ship, and the area of our vehicle presented to the airflow. A ship diving into the atmosphere nose first presents a much smaller cross section than one falling broadside, and the coefficient of drag, which is calculated experimentally and is influenced by the surface of our ship. Smooth metal has less drag than a rough surface, but some of them are counterintuitive, like the dimples in a golf ball helping it have less drag than if it were smooth. Our starships are smooth steel, and we can see the usual drag coefficient of different shapes here. Please note the direction of airflow is this way. A starship going up will be different from these shapes. We can look at the tips of these rockets to get the coefficient of drag for them, and as we look at these shapes, the starship looks most like this bullet shape. But here is actually how we calculate the coefficient of drag. As you can see, the velocity of the rocket and the density of the air it is flying through is used to calculate the coefficient of drag. But these factors change as we climb to orbit. The atmosphere gets thinner and our velocity goes up. That is why we use computers. But understand that the coefficient of drag on the Saturn V changed from a low of 0.237 to a high of 0.447, and this was all calculated by hand and verified by primitive machines. If we relax our brains and look at these equations, they tell us how to calculate the coefficient of drag for velocities less than Mach 0.8. As we go transonic, other factors interfere. We can start with the bottom equation, number 13, and say that the acoustic speed of sound in the air, A, is dependent on temperature, T. And with the acoustic speed of sound and our velocity, we can calculate our Mach number. With our Mach number, we can calculate the Prandtl-Glauert factor here, called beta, and with beta, we can calculate our coefficient of drag. So to recap, the speed of sound in air depends on temperature. The velocity of our ship relative to the speed of sound gives us a Mach number. With the Mach number, we can calculate the beta factor. With the beta factor, we can calculate the coefficient of drag. Here is what I really want you to remember. The speed of sound in an atmosphere is proportional to the temperature of the gas in the atmosphere where the ship is flying. As temperature drops, the speed of sound drops. The Mach number in an atmosphere at a certain altitude is determined by the speed of sound at that altitude. The ship's velocity relative to the speed of sound determines the aerodynamic pressure felt by the ship. The aerodynamic pressure is called Q, and if you multiply Q by the surface area of the ship presented to the airflow, you get a force called the aerodynamic force. This is a form of drag. At some point, as you go through an atmosphere, on launch or coming back down after re-entry, there will be a point where the velocity of your ship and its coefficient of drag at that altitude and air density create the maximum amount of force on your ship. This point of maximum aerodynamic pressure is max Q. This diagram shows us the aerodynamic pressure over time as a rocket climbs out of the atmosphere of Earth. The highest point on this graph is where we find max Q. If we multiply this max Q by the surface area presented to the airflow, we will have the maximum aerodynamic force that will be felt by this rocket. It is at this point that a rocket will throttle back so as not to produce too much stress on the rocket. As it climbs higher and the atmosphere is not as dense, it can accelerate back up to its maximum G tolerance. Now, when I launched my titanium next generation Starship from the moon, I kept it below a thrust to weight ratio of 1.7 to reduce the stress on such a massive ship. Understand that rockets launched from Earth can sometimes exceed 6 Gs, and the Falcon 9 can safely operate at 5 Gs if the propellant tanks are not too full. Now let's review the environment our rocket goes through. Here is the temperature by altitude. Here is the pressure by altitude. Here is the density by altitude. Of course we see a clear correlation between pressure and density. Now if we stayed at the same altitude, this would be our drag by velocity. This shows that the maximum drag would be right at the speed of sound. As we go transonic, then it drops rapidly. This was the image in my head when I was talking about the transonic barrier and max Q in the other lecture. But rockets are not jet fighters. A rocket does not stay at the same altitude like an airplane might. It is climbing up rapidly through decreasing pressure and density. And it is passing through air that gets colder, then warmer, then colder again, and finally really hot. The dynamic pressure, the pressure pushing back on the rocket as it climbs, or the starship or booster as it falls, changes with altitude and we have to calculate as we've just shown. I would love to do the math on Starship, but no Starship has launched into orbit yet. I appreciate you taking this flight down memory lane with me. And as soon as a Starship does fly, we will be analyzing flight data and calculating thrust to weight ratios and mass Q. Though we didn't get to see a launch this weekend, this was a beautiful sight. And it gives me hope for the future.
Thanks for listening. We will try to get two videos out per week from now on, but these are data intensive and people in your dimension have really good attention to detail. Help support us on Patreon if you can, and stay safe at Astro Proterra.